Okay, so um, we're going to learn mostly about uh, benzene and its properties and its reactions. And uh, benzene falls into a class of compounds that are known as uh, aromatic. So <clears throat> the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to try to understand what aromatic means. Uh, it means uh, one thing to normal people. It means one thing to normal people, and it means a completely different thing to chemists. So what do you think of when you hear aromatic? Smell. Smell? Smells good, right? Ooh, that's so aromatic. Aromatic herbs and spices, right? That's not what it means. It has to do with stability, okay? So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, the basic things, this is just an overview. We're just going to look at aromaticity and what it means and how we know it's aromatic. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to look at nomenclature. So I'm hoping to get through a lot of that. And then if we're lucky we'll get through how benzene reacts. And so we'll, we'll get through some of that as well. But aromatic is not that hard to understand. So first of all, we've been talking a lot about resonance. Uh, that was the last chapter and there's this thing called resonance energy i may have defined it in the last slides inadvertently but it's okay do you guys know what it means so you know we talk about resonance stabilization like if you have a molecule and it has resonance it's going to be more stable can it delocalize this charge okay so resonance energy is actually the amount of energy that it's stabilized by so this is the, so when I say, uh, when I say something has five kilojoules of resonance energy, right, that means it's five kilojoules more stable than it would be without resonance. So it's the amount of stability gained by having resonance. And so what we're going to be doing is looking at the resonance energy in benzene. So just to make sure everybody's on the same page, this is benzene. It's a cyclohexatriene. Okay, so cyclohex, right? Six carbons, triene, three double bonds. It's one, three, five. Um, but this is more formally just known as benzene. This is a systematic name. It's called benzene. And um, <clears throat> just to make sure everybody's on the same page again, each one of these has a hydrogen on it. And its formula is C6H6. So <clears throat> it has um, these three double bonds. I remember we, we talked about in order for something to have delocalization or to have resonance, each of these carbons has to have an available p orbital since each carbon has three groups on it in the benzene ring these are all sp2 oops one of the important features that gives benzene is that it's flat it's a flat molecule every carbon is sp2 hybridized it's a ring so every carbon has a p orbital on it. Okay, so how do we establish the resonance energy for benzene? The first thing that people do is they, because there's three double bonds in here, uh, what they do is they go and say, well, how much energy do you get from a double bond without resonance? So they take a similar structure like cyclohexene and they hydrogenate it. And when you hydrogenate it, it releases energy. So the amount of energy released, and, and you know how we are always in, in Chem 3A, we're always in 1A, and all, we're always talking about kilojoules. Organic chemistry has a bunch of old guys in it, and they, for some reason, just stick with KCALs. They don't change. So 
just forget all that kilojoule stuff for a semester. <laughs> just pretend k cals and k joules are proportional, they are, and that you can think the same way. But energy is released, it's 28.6 k cals per mole, right? And that's lower in energy. And so basically what's happened is we've added two hydrogens here. It's called the heat of hydrogenation because you're hydrogenating it. That's what that term is. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Do a whole series of these things, right? So, so if that is the stability from one double bond, oops, sorry. Yeah, I meant to write some of this down. Let's see if I helped myself out. Oh yeah, good. It's not... So what we're going to do is we're going to fill in this chart. And I actually, I think I have it in two places. Nah, that would have been too easy. I do have it, but the, the next time it's all filled out. So basically what we're looking at is... Oh, shoot, shoot, stop. Oh, hang on. Um, yeah, I got to change something in the presentation. Uh, the presentation, if you ever have to do this kind of stuff... Um, you have to get rid of this button that says that advance on mouse click because every time you touch the screen, it goes forward. Super annoying. All right. Okay, so, so what we said is um, that the, the energy is 28.6 kcals per mole lower. So in this diagram here, We went from like that to cyclohexane. That's 28.6 kcals. Now this drawing isn't exactly proportional because I, because of benzene, I wanted you to be able to see things on it. So then the next thing is to think about, well, how much energy would it be for two double bonds? If you had two double bonds in the structure. So typically they draw it like this. Those are two double bonds without uh, delocalization because they're separated by sp2 carbons or sp3 carbons. And, and the, to do that, they just take and they, they calculate two times this value. So this is actually 57.2 in terms of kcals per mole. We're assuming it's all per mole. So then if you were to extend it one more time and say, well, what would three be, right? Three would be like this. That's the only way you can get three on there reasonably. Your prediction is, is that this one would be uh, 85.8 kcals. So that's the progression that people think of when they think of, uh, of how we're trying to understand the effect of resonance in benzene. So think about with one double bond, we measure the energy, then in two double bonds, it'd be twice that. And for three double bonds, be three times that. And then they actually go and they measure the heat hydrogenation for benzene. So that number actually comes out to be right around here. It's 49.8 kcals. So this is the actual value. This is the expected. So the resonance energy for this molecule is around 36 kcals between here and here. So that's what we mean by resonance energy. It's, it's only, well, how do I say this? It's, it's 36 kcals more stable than you predict it to be. So this has some interesting properties on benzene. For one, it's really hard to react benzene because it's so stable relative to what you expect it to be. When it tries to react, its intermediates are so high in energy, it's very stable. So you could take benzene. Benzene, for years, was used as a solvent in organic chemistry uh, for everything because it dissolves everything and it doesn't react, okay? So it's very common to find benzene in a reaction.
Okay, so I'm going to skip some slides because I want the, I added one thing to the slide. So these are all the calculations. Okay, now that's the actual energy for uh, hydrogenation of benzene. Oh, this 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 number should be three, by the way. <clears throat> so how does that compare to other mod? Oh, sorry. Do you want me to do that again? Sorry. Put it back up. That slide number six should. That should be a three in the notes. Is anybody planning on coming to office hours today? You're planning on coming? Okay, we'll go talk for a little bit. We'll talk right. I'm going to probably end a little early because I'm sick. And then I don't want to trap people in my office when I'm sick. So we can talk in here. And then, and then I'm going to head home for a little bit, take a nap, try to wake up for the next class. Are you planning on Sunday office hours? Yeah, how will be here on Sunday probably. Uh, Emmanuel is going to the state championship game for basketball, so I'm planning to go to that on Saturday. Only if I'm better, but I'm I'm taking pictures for the school and I'm taking pictures for the exponent. So we'll see how that goes. They don't pay me. It's just kind of like I've been doing it for so long for Emmanuel that it's kind of like I feel bad if I don't do it. You know, it's kind of like church on Sunday kind of thing. I don't think God's going to hate me if I don't go, but well, maybe he already hates me. But anyways, <laughs> that's a different issue. Okay, so, uh, yeah, 10 years of taking pictures. It's been a long time. Okay, so, um, so that's what we mean by, for benzene being aromatic, aromaticity or an aromatic compound is unusually stable compared to what it's expected to be, okay? There are ways to predict aromaticity, and we'll talk about that um, in a second, but uh, I just thought I'd show you some representative aromatic compounds. Uh, well, okay, so this, that one's always popular, methamphetamine. And methamphetamine is closely re related to adrenaline. Um, adrenaline is actually also known as epinephrine. So when people uh, take epinephrine or norepinephrine for like emergency, like asthma or whatever, right? Uh, it's it's just adrenaline. Uh, they used to just call it adrenaline, and you used to be able to buy a, a, an epinephrine inhaler, and then people start. I think people started using it in sports. <laughs> Oh, you're gonna run a sprint. I better use my inhaler. Yeah, it's a whole different reason that people are using it today. <coughs> uh, aspirin has an aromatic ring in it, an aromatic benzene ring. Uh, but there's a lot of other compounds uh, that are actually aromatic, like fragrances and stuff that have benzene rings in them. Uh, the catch is, is that most things that are aromatic don't smell good, so I'm not gonna get into all of those things. So how can you tell if it's aromatic? Oh yeah, you all these. I forget to take the animations out. <coughs> so here it is. Uh, molecule has to be uh, cyclic and flat. So those are the first two things to think about. It has to be cyclic and it has to be flat. You know, the books will say planar, so you should know that. The other thing that it has to be, uh, I, you know, let me draw benzene over for a second, right? So benzene is here. So it's cyclic. Now, uh, maybe you don't understand that it's flat intuitively, but since all of those are trigonal planar carbons and they're all connected to each other, they're all sp2, right? So this is, each one of these carbons is trigonal planar. Since they're all that way, it has to be flat. Now that same logic doesn't apply as you get to larger rings, unfortunately. So we have to, we have to just understand for benzene and smaller, actually for seven member rings and smaller, that can be true, okay? So cyclic, yeah, we have that. Flat, we have that. It has to be continuously conjugated. which means every carbon has to have a p orbital on it.
And then the, so usually that the, has about the structure, right? Um, and the guy who did these uh, talks, uh, it's probably in the book, was a guy named Huckle. Uh, and this was, you know, more than 100 years ago now. But Huckle's first rule was, in the structure, it has to be cyclic and continuously conjugated. And it was implied that it was flat, but that, I don't know if it actually says that in his version. And then the second rule was it has to have an odd number of electron pairs. Like in this class, we don't get into why it has to be an odd number, but definitely in the the regular organic chemistry class, uh, the the regular. This is a regular class, sorry. And, and the in the majors organic class, we talk about like why that is. We explain like it has to do with the molecular orbitals that are formed from all the atomic orbitals, uh, and we talk about how the electrons fill that uh, all the bonding molecular orbitals. Uh, but that's not actually a topic for this class. But that's the reason why you have to have an odd number of electron pairs. So what does an odd number of electron pairs look like? Well, one can be an odd number of electron pairs, right? What's the other one? Three. Three, yeah. The rule sounds hard, but it's not. And then what's the next one? Five. Yeah. And then, you know, just odd numbers going on up. And actually, um, the rule, you know, over time, these things get modified. Sometimes we'll have multiple electron pairs and it looks like it's an even number, but it turns out that a couple of them don't participate, it ends up being odd again. And so those are for larger structures. And again, not in this class, we don't talk about those, but in the other classes, we talk about that. And I'll show you one example when we talk about hemoglobin. Hemoglobin's an aromatic compound with like 11 electron pairs or 10, nine electron pairs. And then there's a bunch that don't participate. Okay, so let's try using these rules. Oh, let me add one more thing. It's not in, it's not in your text. And I just feel like it's so easy to say it, okay? If you have an even number, makes it anti-aromatic. So there's actually three conditions here, three states that a molecule can be in. It can be aromatic, which is super stable. It could just be non-aromatic, which means it's not special, it doesn't have resonance stabilization. And then it could be anti-aromatic, and anti-aromatic compounds are extremely unstable. So, the, so just like aromatic compounds are stable, molecules that are anti-aromatic end up being exceptionally unstable. And for people who know molecular orbitals, it's because all those electrons go into antibonding orbitals. So. so let's practice here, right? Cyclobutadiene, let's look at the two, we'll call them the first and second rules, Huckel's first and second rules. So by the first rule, cyclobutadiene, is it continuously <coughs> conjugated? Yes, because each one of these, if you draw the hydrogens on here, oops, I didn't mean to go that way. If you draw the hydrogens on here, all right, each one of them has three. So it is um, continuously conjugated. Hang on, I can't spell. I was about to spell. I said continuously conjugated, but I was about to write con conjugated continuously. Not that it matters, but. Oops. I can't spell very well in the first place in the one of the cold. Oh, what was the other thing about structure? It has to be true? Cyclic. Cyclic, yeah, it's cyclic, right? Flat. What about the number of electron pairs? It has to be odd. It has to be odd, so it's an even, right? 
So it's not aromatic. It's actually anti-aromatic. Now, um, just truth be told completely, anti-aromatic makes it so unstable, the molecule folds to not be continuously conjugated. <laughs> it like bends itself just to, it's like, you know, if you put enough pressure on, I don't know, a child to clean his room by standing next to him, eventually they're like, oh, and they go clean their room. Yeah, I don't know if that's a good analogy. Anybody here have kids? Yeah, all right. you're my people. <clears throat> or dogs, oh my gosh, dogs, a lot of work. I just look at the dog when she's done something wrong now and she just goes and walks away. I'm like, nice. She knows she's not supposed to get into my wife's yarn, but she can't help herself when she sees yarn. And now we have lots of like half balls of yarn everywhere. All right, so benzene, right, it's flat. I, I, I'll, we'll just go over this. It's continuously conjugated. And it has three electron pairs. Cyclooctatetraene, right? It's uh, not flat. We covered this in the last lecture, I think. But it's not flat. So it can't be aromatic just based on that. But it also has an even number of electron pairs. It turns out if it had an odd number of electron pairs, it would flatten itself out to become aromatic. The, the resonance stabilization would be enough energy that the molecule would bend itself flat so the electrons could be continuously conjugated. Now, we'll talk about that as we go along. Uh, you can also have aromatic ions, right? So if you take cyclopentadiene, right, and this guy is, oops, sorry. Keep touching this advanced button. This has two hydrogens on it, right? So if I take this hydrogen off, but leave the electrons, I'll end up with cyclopentadienyl anion. So this is remove hydrogen plus. And then when you look at that, right, even though it's not six members, it's got one, two, and, and here's the thing to remember, if the, if the lone pair can be made at sp2, right? That carbon can be made sp2 and it makes an odd number of electrons, right? It will participate in delocalization. So this becomes the third pair here. So just like in resonance, when I said if you have a lone pair and it can be involved in resonance, it will be involved in resonance. Same thing's true for aromatic compounds. If you have a lone pair that can participate in delocalization and that gives it an odd number of electron pairs, it will do that, okay? So this is aromatic. And then you could actually draw a lot of resonance structures to show the sp2 nature of that carbon. Okay, so I moved that pair of electrons. I didn't do the other one yet. What do I have to do? Move one to the yeah. Yeah, move one to the upper left corner. So that's that pattern I see. You should get used to seeing that because that's the one that's hard for people uh, to remember sometimes. And then you end up with this, right? And then if you're thinking about what's going on here, right, that, that carbon is sp2 hybridized in that resonance structure. And in most of the resonance structures, there's five of them that you draw, and I'm going to do them all right now, but... There's five of them that you can draw that would make that thing uh, sp2 hybridized. Now, for the cyclopentadienyl cation, right? 
that's SP2. Because what I did here is I removed H with its electrons. I pulled that off. That's how you got the positive charge, right? This guy is SP2, but it's actually anti-aromatic because there are only one, two electron pairs involved. Another example of an aromatic ion um, is this one. It's the cycloheptatrienyl cation, right? And the anion, the two possibilities. Again, uh, going to. Oh, should I keep doing that? Going to the left, all right? This is minus H and a pair of electrons. So. Oh, and I should point out this. That's where you're starting from, right? That's actually not a flat molecule. It's got a bend to it. It's big enough and the angle is large enough that it has a little bit of a bend to it. And so what we do is we remove one of these hydrogens. And what happens is this is now sp2, right? So it has a hydrogen on it. We can draw the hydrogen. I can leave the hydrogen there if you want. So I remove one of the two hydrogens with its electron, and I have one, two, three. It wasn't flat before you took it off, but now that you took it off, and it could be continuously conjugated, that molecule flattens out and is aromatic, okay? So this is an aromatic ion. This one over here would be anti-aromatic, so it won't be flat, most likely. Don't know for sure, but. I'm going to show you a couple of polycyclic aromatic rings. Um, I will ask that you learn a couple of these. Um, this one in particular, I'd like you to know. Right. And we're going to apply Huckel's rule to it and all that stuff, and we'll see. Uh, it still follows Huckel's rules. This one is known as naphthalene. Uh, it's the sort of the smell of your grandma's closet where she hangs all her fine wool and stuff. It's mothballs, right? That's one of the reasons why I want you to know it. And uh, just to show you, there are one, two, three, four, five, right? Electron pairs, so it's an odd number. Uh, and uh, it's continuously conjugated at every carbon. Like every carbon, right, has three groups on it. I can draw the hydrogens in, but every carbon has three groups on it, so it follows Huckel's rule. When you look at the electrostatic potential map, we talked about these a little bit last time, right, you can see how the electrons are distributed evenly over the entire structure. Um, this other molecule is kind of interesting. Uh, you'll notice how the electrons are mostly in this region here. It gets that if this electron pair goes like this, and then this electron pair goes like that. And then that one ring by itself becomes aromatic. Okay. So it ends up the whole thing is aromatic, but it, you notice how the electron density is focused all on this side. It's very electron dense. It's because that one ring can push, you can push a negative charge into that side and make that side aromatic. The other side, you create a positive charge, right? And so there's less electron density on that side of the ring. So don't worry about azulene. Although I think I gave a lecture on it one time for something, I remember. Uh, don't worry about anthracene and some of these others, but you can see how uh, counting electrons, right? I'll just count it on the screen. All right, I'll just tick them off. One, two, three, four. Oops, sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? And then phenanthrene is this anthracene with the one ring moved up. 
and Christine has nine pairs. So this idea that you know odd numbers makes things aromatic is applied to all kinds of stuff. You can also have heterocyclic aromatic rings. Um, I would want you to know all these names too. So this is all memorization stuff. Pyridine, uh, parole, furan, and thiophene. And you can see furan and thiophene are very closely related to each other, right? Um, and parole is closely related as well because it's just the substitution of the nitrogen, oxygen, and the sulfur. And they're related to cyclopentadiene, which is like their cousin, who's not aromatic. Okay, so <sighs> these are all aromatic. Hey, look, there's an update available. I think it just told me that by restarting. Okay. Um, oh, it's still recording, good. If you think about um, an SP2 hybridized atom, right? And let's take, for example, just this. And we say it's flat, right? Then it's going to look like this. It's going to have the p orbital like this, right? And then all the other groups will be around the middle. That's what it means to be like sp2 hybridized. It has three groups bonded like this, and then it has a p orbital, and the p orbital makes the pi bond. So this is for the pi bond. And then we have the sigma bonds. So in this molecule here, in pyridine, I'm just to draw the bottom of it. So that's just the bottom of it. I have a lone pair, and this is in a hybridized orbital like this. The p orbital that is in the pi, this pi, this pi bond here, the p orbital for that is right there. Okay, so it's sticking up. So what that means is that this pair of electron is in the plane. of the molecule and it can't participate it can't get into that p orbital to be delocalized so this guy is in an sp2 orbital right Does that makes sense you want me to build it i can kind of show it to you better if i build it maybe let me build it let me get the big model This represents an sp2 hybridized atom. And when it's double bonded to something, so I'm gonna put a hydrogen, or um, I'll just put other carbons around it for now. So when, when two atoms are double bonded, just to go over this again, they're flat like this. And on the top and bottom here, that's where the p orbitals are. Right, so this is sp2 hybridized. 
And then these two orbitals have to line up in order for there to be communication, a pi bond between the two. This was the whole idea when I did the dancing thing, right? You make two connections and you can't rotate. But that also means for these molecules, when you have this connection here and a connection here, the whole molecule's flat. If you replace one of these and you put a lone pair in its place, that lone pair can't connect with these ones because it's in a different plane of the molecule than the pi bonds are. So the double bonds would be up here. So like if I were to build benzene, which unfortunately I don't think I can with one color, but I might be able to build it with all the colors they give me. It's like uh, they're just cheap enough to make you have to buy another pair for 300, another set for $300. I can't believe they don't give you six. I've actually never tried to do this because I just assumed they didn't give me. I'll have to apologize to him later if they give me six. I have five. <gasps> what a nice company this is <laughs> for selling these for $300. Okay, so this would be what benzene looks like, right? And this would be one of the hydrogens. So this whole molecule, all these are P orbitals sticking out here. So I can put red, uh, red stumps up there, I guess, if I have enough. <coughs> This is like an organizational nightmare. I spent a whole lab period while students were working on stuff, winding cords and putting everything straight. And I tell people I don't have ADHD, but I have this, these moments, you know, that I'm like, these cords are all crooked. So that would be the P orbitals like that. And when, when I say electrons are delocalized in benzene, like this would be one double bond, this would be another double bond, and this is another double bond. But if these electrons move here, then the double bonds are here, here, and here. They just rotate around. Okay? That's where the electrons are. But, but in reality, the electrons are just moving around this cloud. Right? Now, if you have an electron pair here, it would be sticking out like that. And this electron pair can't participate with these because it's not in line with these. They have to be in line with each other. So the basic rule then is this. If an electron pair can contribute, it can. But the other part of the rule is it can only, an atom can only contribute one pair at a time because the other pair is always in a different plane. Okay? So it matters a lot. It doesn't matter much with benzene because there's never a question about how many electron pairs in benzene participate on carbon. But when you have hetero atoms, like these oxygens have two, right? Well, how many of those can contribute? Well, it turns out only one can because that makes it aromatic. And then the second one is in a different plane of the molecule. It's in the plane with the molecule, I should say. Okay, so if you look at parole, right, it has one, two, so this would be the third, this guy here and then it's aromatic. And then you can draw a bunch of resonance structures and it makes sense that it's aromatic. For furan, you have two that could contribute, right? Only one of the two does. So it can go like this and like this. Where's the other one actually at then? Well, if this is the oxygen and it becomes sp2 hybridized, the other one's in the plane with the molecule. And it makes that, again, making the molecule flat. And then for thiophene, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, now, it turns out furan is more aromatic than thiophene. Like, you can have really, you know, not that you guys care, but it, it, it is more aromatic than thiophene. Is. Just because the oxygen is closer in size to the uh, carbons. So having said that, on a drawing, this is what people make it look like, right? And they, this is a drawing of pyridine. And you'll notice that in pyridine, uh, there's a bright red spot over here, right? And all the other carbons that are in the structure right, have hydrogens on them. So that's the little blue bumps. 
But this is the lone pair of the pyridines. It's not participating in delocalization. Because if it did, that would make a second electron pair, right? It'd be anti-aromatic, plus it already has one contributing, so it can't contribute to. So contributing electron pairs per atom is just one. And why, there's a couple of reasons. Usually uh, uh, the one that we're looking for, though, is because it's in the plane with the molecule. Uh, because a sec, sorry, because a second would be in the plane of the molecule. <sighs> sure feels longer than 55 minutes. Yesterday I went 30 minutes. I said, was that a lecture? And, you know, every the students were looking at me like went like this. And then we sat and looked at the clock. And I said, okay, what time is it I started? And I, I kept coming to the answer that I'd only lectured for 30 minutes and not an hour and 15. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, and then we've already talked about the, these, but again, right? The, the way the orbitals line up, there's a lone pair in a p orbital, so you get delocalization that way. And then for the oxygen, one of the lone pairs is in a p orbital, and the other is in the plane with the molecule. So this is, this, these pairs delocalize, and this one is in the plane. So, in general, one pair contributes per atom. And um, won't contribute if it makes it, the only time it doesn't contribute is when it makes it an anti-aromatic. Like one pair, if you have one pair that can contribute and, and doesn't, it's because it would make it anti-aromatic. So let's just go ahead one and draw the resonance contributors. I thought this would be useful. It's kind of a review of what we did and drawing all those resonance structures. And then I'll leave the other one to you. There's furan on the pages too. So remember the, the pattern that we're looking at to draw the resonance structures, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because I think you guys kind of understand it pretty well, is you push a pair of electrons like this you go like that. And the only reason you're doing this is because it gives it an odd number of electron pairs, and that makes it aromatic. Don't forget your charges. And then if uh, you miss it, it'll be in the recording anyways. There's a lot of them on this one. So hopefully you can follow that. I just drew them all. Do your thing and I'll give you a couple minutes and then you can just look up and check. But we've done a lot of these resonance structures in the last uh, week. so. And if you didn't get it, then stop it and we'll fix it. Me to do. 
historia. All right, do you guys get that? More or less? You might start in the wrong direction. Any of them that you need help with? So I'll just show you, like if you're gonna do the next one, it's exactly the same. But I, want, I also wanna show you something else about the electrostatic potential map of that last one. In the electrostatic potential map, you'll notice how it's blue here and the red is all shifted in the upward direction. That's because that pair of electrons actually pushes, in, of the nitrogen, pushes into the ring and puts a lot more electron density in the ring. And at the same time, it creates a positive charge on the nitrogen. So you end up with more positive charge on this end of the molecule and the more negative charge on the other. It actually gives the molecule a strong dipole pointing the opposite way than you would predict if you were doing that kind of stuff. So it gives it some interesting properties. Nobody likes working with this stuff because it smells really bad. Dead fish times two. Always makes you want to gag when you smell it the first time. And then the smell magically goes away because you sort of become desensitized to it. But yeah, that's actually a bad sign. That's how things kill people. All right, so I won't go over Furan. Um, I'm gonna skip this, uh, these. You don't have to memorize all these. All the, you'll notice purine on here. I just wanted to show one other. Is this one, this is uh, porphyrin, uh, and you don't have to memorize porphyrin, but um, porphyrin is a aromatic um, ring that we find in natural systems. You find it in hemoglobin. You find it in chlorophyll. It's a pretty common molecule, right, uh, in nature that's found for the use of binding oxygen and hemoglobin, but it's also used for capturing light and chlorophyll and uh, transfers. I don't know why it's such a common, I'm sure some biologists have some really good explanation why it's so many places. We're gonna count the electrons and we're just gonna go around the outside, okay? So we're gonna go like this. I'll start here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So those are the nine for the Huckle rule. But there's a lot of other double bonds in there, right? Their only purpose really is to make this, this is S, it makes that sp2 hybridized. So it's hyb, sp2 hybridized all the way around. And so rather than use that um, electrons on that carbon, those electrons actually push towards the middle. And that allows these outer electrons to delocalize around the whole structure. So like in chlorophyll, one of the properties of chlorophyll is that it captures light energy and converts it into electrons. And those electrons transfer through those pi bonds. And they go down, it's connected to a long conjugated molecule. Those electrons go down that long conjugated molecule through the pi bonds. So this is really like a circular wire that the electrons that are captured can travel around. Uh, let's see what else is there. Yeah, so uh, if, you, if you actually counted, you know, some of these other electrons, you, it, it seems like it's not aromatic, but it still works out to be aromatic. Huckle never intended his rule to be used on molecules like this, but it still kind of works. Oh, yeah, and it binds iron. It also binds magnesium and chlorophyll. Sorry. I'll skip all that. For a second, I have to look at that other plant and say, what did they put in there? That's the book's picture. It looks awfully suspicious. Okay, we're going to do the nomenclature. We're going to name, right? It's basically a substituent and then benzene. Okay? Substituent and then benzene. So, for example, 
bromobenzene, chlorobenzene, nitrobenzene, ethylbenzene, right? Now, we haven't gone over the nitrile functional group, but that, I mean, just know that that's how that's done. So pretty simple. Now, if you had a disubstituted benzene, then you have to put on numbers, right? So I don't know if I have the disubstituted ones. No, I don't have them right away. So I'm gonna go ahead and do those because I want you to see this. If you have this, That's dibromobenzene, right? But it's 1,4 dibromobenzene, because you go 1, 2, 3, 4. This would be 1, 3. Oh, by the way, the circle indicates the aromatic nature of benzene. It's like the resonance hybrid. You just don't draw the double bonds anymore. You just make a circle. Sorry. I don't know I just threw that at you. This is one, three, dibromobenzene, and this will be one, two. So I'll write the name out here in a second. So you can just do that for benzene. So this is one, four, dibromo. This is one, three, dibromo. And this is one, two, di. And then the last part of it's always benzene. Okay, so having said that, there's another nomenclature system that you need to know for the for if you have two substituents, and it's it's kind of important. So I thought I'm going to introduce it. I don't know where it does it in the book actually, if it even does it. It's ortho, it's meta, and para. And you're going to have to learn it when we do the reaction. So I want you to know what that means. Okay, ortho, meta, and para. Para means like if on in line with each other like parallel right and then meta is the in between <laughs> like they have a meta thought right it's an in between thought and then ortho i don't know what that means <laughs> it means ortho so i always remember it is like umpa like umpa loompas and then like o m and p and then the a just made it umpa so they could also be called uh, para dibromobenzene, meta dibromobenzene, right? And ortho dibromobenzene. But when you do it, right, you don't have to write ortho, meta, and para all the way out. You just say O, M, and P. So let me write out what ortho, meta, and para are. O is ortho, M is meta. And P is para. But if I write para dibromobenzene, then you'd have to come up with that one. Right? And in the name, I'd probably write it out. So. Well, unfortunately for you guys, I did make it to this slide. There's a lot of common names that are used all the time for substituted benzenes. So I'm going to put a couple of these on the test. You just have to memorize what these different ones are. Now I will tell you which ones are my favorite. <laughs> that doesn't mean those are the only ones, but um, let's see. Phenol smells good. I like that one. Toluene reminds me uh, that I live by a truck stop. I don't like aniline because it smells bad. Benzaldehyde sort of smells like almonds, actually. Aldehydes have a sweet fragrance to them, okay? And benzoic acid is in all kinds of stuff, and we use it for making aspirin and other things like that. Those are probably the, oh, I'm gonna circle aniline even though I hate it because it smells bad. But um, yeah, those are probably the more common ones that you need to know. Anisole has sort of a sickly sweet smell, so I don't, I'm not a big fan. I don't know that I've ever spelled benzonitrile. And styrene is what we make polystyrene out of plastics, like styrofoam and stuff like that. Okay. So try to focus on those ones that I circled. Because if I inter... Let me see. Uh, all right. Sorry, I'm getting these messages. 
And I'm going to teach you one reaction. And it's an electrophilic aromatic, oh, uh, yeah, so, er, electrophilic aromatic substitution. Okay. So this is the format of an electrophilic aromatic substitution. First of all, this top one is known as an addition reaction. So, you know, remember we did electrophilic substitutions of alkenes with hydrogen halides, for example. So this could have been H and Cl, like that, right? And when we did an addition reaction, what ends up happening is across the double bond, the electrophile is added to one side and the nucleophile is added to the other. Okay. So in addition and elim addition elimination reactions, that's what they actually call these electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. The first step is an addition, but the second step is actually called an elimination. So what ends up happening um, in this reaction is you have a hydrogen and it gets replaced by the electrophile. And then the benzene ring comes back, okay? So you don't lose any of your double bonds. You just replace the hydrogen with the electrophile. I know it's like magic. I'm gonna show you briefly what the mechanism looks like, but I won't test you on the mechanism this week, but I do want you to learn, the, uh, I'm gonna learn, have you learn at least one reaction. Okay, so here's what the reaction mechanism looks like. The electrophile attracts the electrons. So if you're drawing this out, it's gonna go like this, right? And that'll be attached to the ring. Now, the position in the ring it attaches to is where the hydrogen gets eliminated from, the one it's substituting. So what it's gonna happen is it's gonna attach itself to here and the positive charge has to be on the opposite side, just like it always is, right? So you notice what happens is this is aromatic, and this is not aromatic, non-aromatic. It's not anti-aromatic, it's just non-aromatic. So the thing is, is that if you can, take this hydrogen, right, and remove it and push the electrons back in, it'll be aromatic again. And so there's a big incentive. It's, right now it's very unstable, it's a carbocation, it's not aromatic anymore, and the molecule really wants to get back to being aromatic, okay? So in the next step of the reaction, what ends up happening is whatever nucleophile you had, so you had an electrophile and a nucleophile, so it could have been even like, um, well, we don't have good examples of it because we didn't do the reaction, so never mind. Yeah, so, <laughs> sorry, I was thinking that, oh yeah, I could just use, but we didn't do that reaction, so I can't talk about it. Um, so you have whatever nucleophile you have in solution, oh, shoot, comes in and grabs that hydrogen. Did I skip a slide? Hang on. No, I guess not. I just drew it in. The nucleophile comes and takes the hydrogen and it makes it aromatic again. So this is again, the intermediate. This is the intermediate from the previous slide. And then this is aromatic again. So that's the reason why when you have a benzene ring and you try to do an electrophilic addition to it, you usually get a substitution rather than just an addition reaction, okay? So they often, like I said, they often call it, this is known as the elimination step because you're eliminating the hydrogen from the ring, creating a double bond, right? So that's often known as the elimination step. So that's why they call it an addition elimination. You add something first and then you eliminate the hydrogen. Um, there are a number of resonance structures for this intermediate. Oops. Right, so you can draw it like that. 
And then this pair comes into here. Like that. And you can also eliminate, like if the nucleophile comes in here again, it can also come in here and then just go like that. So can the limit, regardless of where the resonance structure is, you always end up with the same product. But yeah, there are a lot of resonance structures that stabilize that intermediate, but it's still relative because it's a carbocation, it's relatively unstable. So you know what, I, I changed my mind. I think I will have you do that part of the mechanism. I'll tell you exactly the question I'm gonna ask you though. Uh, is I'm gonna give you this, oops, and have you draw the mechanism. Because that mechanism is exactly the same. The only thing that changes is what's the electrophile and what's the nucleophile. <coughs> and knowing that one mechanism, <coughs> sorry, I almost made it all the way. Knowing that one mechanism actually is enough that you know how all of those reactions work. And that's what we'll start with um, for the next quiz, not this quiz. After the quiz, we'll talk about these reactions. <coughs> but they all operate the same way. You have an electrophile and a nucleophile. It opens the ring and it closes the ring and then it's done. Okay. Holy moly.